Chapter Four of the Red Dust by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, The Forest of Death. They were oblivious to everything but each other, say a resting and still half incredulous happiness against Burl's shoulder, while he told her in little jerky sentences of his pursuit of the colossal flying beetle, of his search for the tribe, and then his discovery of her apparently lifeless body. When he spoke of the monster that had lurched from the mushroom thicket, and of the desperation with which he had faced it, Saya pressed close and looked at him with wondering and wonderful eyes. She could understand his willingness to die, believing her dead. A little while before she had felt the same indifference to life. A timid, frightened whisper roused them from their absorption, and they looked up. One of the tribesmen stood upon one foot some distance away, staring at them, almost convinced that he looked upon the living dead. A sudden movement on the part of either of them would have sent him in a panic back into the mushroom forest. Two or three blond heads bobbed and vanished among the tangled stalks. Wide and astonished eyes gazed at the two they had believed the prey of malignant creatures. The tribe had come slowly back to the mushroom they had been eating, leaderless, and convinced that Saya had fallen a victim to the deadly dust. Instead they found her sitting by the side of their chief, apparently restored to them in some miraculous fashion. Burl spoke, and the pink-skinned people came timorously from their hiding-places. They approached warily, and formed a half-circle before the seated pair. Burl spoke again, and presently one of the bravest dared approach and touch him. Instantly a babble of the crude and labial language spoken by the tribe broke out. Awed questions and exclamations of thankfulness, then curious interrogations filled the air. Burl for once showed some common sense. Instead of telling them in his usual vainglorious fashion of the adventures he had undergone, he merely cast down the two long and tapering antennae from the flying beetle that he had torn from its dead body. They looked at them and recognized their origin. Amazement and admiration showed upon their faces. Then Burl rose and abruptly ordered two of the men to make a chair of their hands for Saya. She was weak from the effects of the blow she had received. The two men humbly advanced and did as they were bid. Then the march was taken up again, more slowly than before, because of Saya as a burden, but none the less steadily. Burl led his people across the country, marching in advance, and with every nerve alert for signs of danger, but with more confidence and less timidity than he had ever displayed before. All that noontime and that afternoon they filed steadily along, the tribesfolk keeping in a compact group close behind Burl. The man who had thrown away his spear had recovered it on an order from Burl, and the little party fairly bristled with weapons, though Burl knew well that they were liable to be cast away as impediments if flight should be necessary. He was determined that his people should learn to fight the great creatures about them, instead of depending upon their legs for escape. He had led them in an attack upon great slugs, but they were defenseless creatures, incapable of more dangerous maneuvers than spasmodic jerkings of their great bodies. The next time danger should threaten them, and especially if it came while their new awe of him held good, he was resolved to force them to join him in fighting it. He had not long to wait for an opportunity to strengthen the spirit of his followers by a successful battle. The clouds toward the west were taking on a dull red hue, which was the nearest to a sunset that was ever seen in the world of Burl's experience, when a bumblebee droned heavily over their heads, making for its hive. The little group of people on the ground looked up, and saw a scanty load of pollen packed in the stiff bristles of the insect's hind legs. The bees of the world had a hard time securing food upon the nearly flowerless planet 
but this one had evidently made a find. Its crop was nearly filled with hard-gathered, viscous honey destined for the hival store. It sped onward heavily, its almost transparent wings mere blurs in the air from the rapidity of their vibration. Burl saw its many faceted eyes staring before it in worried preoccupation as it soared in laborious speed over his head some fifty feet up. He dropped his glance, and then his eyes lighted with excitement. A slender-bodied wasp was shooting upward from an ambush it had found in a thicket of toadstools. It darted swiftly and gracefully upon the bee, which swerved and tried to flee. The droning buzz of the bee's wings rose to a higher note as it strove to increase its speed. The more delicately formed wasp headed the clumsier insect back. The bee turned again and fled in terror. Each of the insects was slightly more than four feet in length, but the bee was much the heavier, and it could not attain the speed of which the wasp was capable. The graceful form of the hunting insect rapidly overhauled its fleeing prey, and the wasp dashed in and closed with the bee at a point almost over the heads of the tribesmen. In a clawing, biting tangle of thrashing transparent wings and black bodies, the two creatures tumbled to the earth. They fell perhaps thirty yards from where Burl stood watching. Over and over the two insects rolled, now one uppermost and then the other. The bee was struggling desperately to insert her sting in the more supple body of her adversary. She writhed and twisted, fighting with jaw and mandible, wing and claw. The wasp was uppermost and the bee lay on her back, fighting in panic-stricken desperation. The wasp saw an opening, her jaws darted in, and there was an instant of confusion. Then suddenly the bee, dazed, was upright with the wasp upon her, a movement too quick for the eye to follow, and the bee collapsed. The wasp had bitten her in the neck where all the nerve cords passed, and the bee was dead. Burl waited a moment more aflame with excitement. He knew, as did all the tribesfolk, what might happen next. When he saw the second act of the tragedy well begun, Burl snapped quick and harsh orders to his spear-armed men, and they followed him in a wavering line, their weapons tightly clutched. Knowing the habits of the insects as they were forced to know them, they knew that the venture was one of the least dangerous they could undertake with fighting creatures the size of the wasp, but the idea of attacking the great creatures whose sharp stings could annihilate any of them with a touch, the mere thought of taking the initiative was appalling. Had their awe of Burl been less complete, they would not have dreamed of following him. The second act of the tragedy had begun. The bee had been slain by the wasp, a carnivorous insect normally, but the wasp knew that sweet honey was concealed in the half-filled crop of the bee. Had the bee arrived safely at the hive, the sweet and sticky liquid would have been disgorged and added to the hival store. Now, though the bee's journey was ended and its flesh was to be crunched and devoured by the wasp, the honey was the first object of the pirate's solicitude. The dead insect was rolled over upon its back, and with eager haste the slayer began to exploit the body. Burl and his men were creeping nearer, but with a gesture Burl bade them halt for a moment. The wasp's first move was to force the disgorgement of the honey from the bee's crop, and with feverish eagerness it pressed upon the limp body until the shining, sticky liquid appeared. Then the wasp began, in ghoulish ecstasy, to lick up the sweet stuff, utterly absorbed in the feast. Many thousands of years before, the absorption of the then tiny insect had been noticed when engaged in a similar feat, and it was recorded in books moldered into dust long ages before Burl's birth, that its rapture was so great that it had been known to fall a victim to a second bandit while engaged in the horrible banquet. Burl had never read the books, but he had been told that the pirate would continue its feast 
even though seized by a greater enemy, unable to tear itself from the nectar gathered by the creature it had slain. The tribesmen waited until the wasp had begun its orgy, licking up the toothsome stuff disgorged by its dead prey. It ate in gluttonous haste, blind to all sights, deaf to all sounds, able to think of nothing, conceive of nothing, but the delights of the liquid it was devouring. At a signal the tribesmen darted forward. They wavered when near the slender waist gourmet, however, and Burl was the first to thrust his spear, with all his strength, into the thinly armored body. Then the others took courage. A short horny spear penetrated the very vitals of the wasp. A club fell with terrific impact upon the slender waist. There was a crackling, and the long spidery limbs quivered and writhed, while the tribesmen fell back in fear, but without cause. Burl struck again, and the wasp fell into two writhing halves, helpless for harm. The pink-skinned men danced in triumph and the women and children ventured near, delighted. Only Burl noticed that even as the wasp was dying, sundered and pierced with spears, its slender tongue licked out in one last ecstatic taste of the nectar that had been its undoing. Burdened with the pollen-covered legs of the giant bee, and filled with the meat from choice portions of the wasp's muscular limbs, the tribe resumed its journey. This time Burl had men behind him, still timid, still prone to flee at the slightest alarm, but infinitely more dependable than they had been before. They had attacked and slain a wasp whose sting would have killed any of them. They had done battle under the leadership of Burl, whose spear had struck the first blow. Henceforth they were sharers, in a mild way, of his transcendent glory, and henceforth they were more like followers of a mighty chief, and less like spineless worshippers of a demigod, whose feats they were too timid to emulate. That night they hid among a group of giant puffballs, feasting on the loads of meat they had carried thus far with them. Burl watched them now without jealousy of their good spirits. He and Saya sat a little apart, happy to be near each other, speaking in low tones. After a time darkness fell, and the tribefolk became shapeless bodies speaking in voices that grew drowsy and were silent. The black forms of the toadstool's heads and huge puffballs were but darker against a dark sky. The nightly rain began to fall, drop by drop, drop by drop, upon the damp and humid earth. Only Burl remained awake for a little while, and his last waking thought was of pride, disinterested pride. He had the first reward of the ruler, gratification in the greatness of his people. The red mushrooms had continued to show their glistening heads, though Burl thought they were less numerous than in the territory from which the tribe had fled. All along the route, now to the right, now to the left, they had burst and sent their masses of deadly dust into the air. Many times the tribe folk had been forced to make a detour to avoid a slowly spreading cloud of death-dealing spores. Once or twice their escapes had been narrow indeed, but so far there had been no deaths. Burl had observed that the mushrooms normally burst only in the daytime, and for a while had thought of causing his followers to do their journeying in the night. Only the obvious disadvantages of such a course, the difficulty of discovering food, and the prowling spiders that roamed in the darkness, had prevented him. The idea still stayed with him, however, and two days after the fight with the hunting wasp, he put it in practice. The tribe came to the top of a small rise in the ground. For an hour they had been marching and counter-marching to avoid the suddenly appearing clouds of dust. Once they had been nearly hemmed in, 
and only by mad sprinting did they escape when three of the dull red clouds seemed to flow together, closing three sides of a circle. They came to the little hillock and halted. Before them stretched a plain all of four miles wide, covered a brownish brick red by masses of mushrooms. They had seen mushroom forests before, and knew of the dangers they presented. But there was none so deadly as the plain before them. To the right and left it stretched as far as the eye could see, but far away on its farther edge Burl caught a glimpse of flowing water. Over the plain itself a dull red haze seemed to float. It was nothing more or less than a cloud of the deadly spores, dispersed and indefinite, constantly replenished by the freshly bursting red mushrooms. While the people stood and watched, a dozen thick columns of dust rose into the air from scattered points here and there upon the plain, settling slowly again, but leaving behind them enough of their finely divided substance to keep the thin red haze over the whole plain in its original deadly state. Burl had seen single red mushrooms before, and even small thickets of two or three, but here was a plain of millions, literally millions upon millions, of the malignant growths. Here was one fungoid forest through whose aisles no monster beetles stalked, and above whose shadowed depths no brightly colored butterflies fluttered in joyous abandon. There were no loud-voiced crickets sitting in its hiding places, nor bodies of eagerly foraging ants searching inquisitively for bits of food. It was a forest of death, still and silent, quiet and motionless, save for the sullen columns of red dust that ever and again shot upward from the torn and ragged envelope of the bursting mushroom. Burl and his people watched in wonderment and dismay. But presently a high resolve came to Burl. The mushrooms never burst at night, and the deadly dust from a subsided cloud was not deadly in the morning. As a matter of fact, the rain that fell every night made it no more than a sodden thin film of reddish mud by daylight, mud which dried and caked. Burl did not know what occurred, but knew the result. At night or in early morning the danger from the red mushrooms was slight, therefore he would lead his people through the very jaws of death that night. He would lead them through the deadly aisles of this, the forest of malignant growths, the place of lurking annihilation. It was an act of desperation, and the resolution to carry it through left Burl in a state of mind that kept him from observing one thing that would have ended all the struggles of his tribe at once. Perhaps a quarter-mile from the edge of the red forest three or four giant cabbages grew, thrusting their colossal leaves upward toward the sky. And on the cabbages a dozen lazy slugs fed leisurely, ignoring completely the red haze that was never far from them, and sometimes covered them. Burl saw them, but the oddity of their immunity from the effects of the red dust did not strike him. He was fighting to keep his resolution intact. If he had only realized the significance of what he saw, however, the slugs were covered with a thick, soft fur. The tribespeople wore garments of that same material. The fur protected the slugs and could have made the tribe immune to the deadly red dust if they had only known. The slugs breathed through a row of tiny holes upon their backs, as the mature insects breathed through holes upon the bottom of their abdomens. And the soft fur formed a mat of felt which arrested the fine particles of deadly dust while allowing the pure gas to pass through. It formed, in effect, a natural gas mask which the tribesmen could have adopted, but which they did not discover or invent. The remainder of that day they waited in a curious mixture of resolve and fear. The tribe was rapidly reaching a point where it would follow Burl over a thousand-foot cliff, 
and it needed some such blind confidence to make them prepare to go through the forest of the million deadly mushrooms. The waiting was a strain, but the actual journey was a nightmare. Burl knew that the toadstools did not burst of themselves during the night, but he knew that the beetle on which he had taken his involuntary ride had crashed against one in the darkness, and that the fatal dust had poured out. He warned his people to be cautious and led them down the slope of the hill through the blackness. For hours they stumbled on in utter darkness, with the pungent acrid odor of the red growths constantly in their nostrils. They put out their hands and touched the flabby, damp stalks of the monstrous things. They stumbled and staggered against the leathery skins of the malignant fungoids. Death was all about them. At no time during all the dark hours of the night was there a moment when they could not reach out their hands and touch a fungus growth that might burst at their touch and fill the air with poisonous dust so that all of them would die in gasping, choking agony. And worst of all, before half an hour was passed, they had lost all sense of direction, so that they stumbled on blindly through the utter blackness, not knowing whether they were heading toward the river that might be their salvation, or were wandering hopelessly deeper and deeper into the silent depths of the forest of strangled things. When day came again, and the mushrooms sent their columns of fatal dust into the air, would they gasp and fight for breath in the red haze that would float like a tenuous cloud above the forest? Would they breathe in flames of fire-like torment and die slowly? Or would the red dust be merciful and slay them quickly? They felt their way like blind folk, devoid of hope and curiously unafraid. Only their hearts were like heavy, cold weights in their breasts, and they shouldered aside the swollen sacks of the red mushrooms with a singular apathy as they followed Burl slowly through the midst of death. Many times in their journeying they knew that dead creatures were nearby, moths, perhaps, that had blundered into a distended growth which had burst upon the impact and killed the thing that had touched it. No busy insect scavengers ventured into this plain of silence to salvage the bodies, however. The red haze preserved the sanctuary of malignants inviolate. During the day no creature might hope to approach its red aisles and dust-carpeted clearings, and at night the slow-dropping rain fell only upon the rounded heads of the mushrooms. In all the space of the forest only the little band of hopeless people, plodding on behind Burl in the velvet blackness, callously rubbed shoulders with death in the form of the red and glistening mushrooms. Over all the dank expanse of the forest the only sound was the dripping of the slow and sodden rainfall that began at nightfall and lasted until day came again. The sky began to grow faintly gray as the sun rose behind the banks of overhanging clouds. Burl stopped short and uttered what was no more than a groan. He was in a little circular clearing, and the twisted monstrous forms of the deadly mushrooms were all about. There was not yet enough light for colors to appear, and the hideous, almost obscene shapes of the loathsome growths on every side showed only as mocking, leering silhouettes as of malicious demons, rejoicing at the coming doom of the gray-faced, huddled tribefolk. Burl stood still, drooping in discouragement upon his spear. The feathery moth's antenna bound upon his forehead shadowed darkly against the graying sky. Soon the mushrooms would begin to burst. Then suddenly he lifted his head. Encouragement and delight upon his features, he had heard the ripple of running water. His followers looked at him with dawning hope. Without a word Burl began to run, and they followed him more slowly. His voice came back to them in a shout of delight. Then they, too, broke into a jog-trot.
In a moment they had emerged from the thick tangle of brownish-red stalks, and were upon the banks of a wide and swiftly running river, the same river whose gleam Burl had caught the day before from the farther side of the mushroom forest. Once before Burl had floated down a river upon a mushroom raft. Then his journey had been involuntary and unlooked for. He had been carried far from his tribe and far from Saya, and his heart had been filled with desolation. Now he viewed the swiftly running current with eager delight. He cast his eyes up and down the bank. Here and there the river bank rose in a low bluff, and thick shelf growths stretched out above the water. Burl was busy in an instant, stabbing the hard growths with his spear, and striving to wrench them free. The tribesmen stared at him, uncomprehending, but at an order from him they did likewise. Soon a dozen thick masses of firm light fungus lay upon the shore where it shelved gently into the water. Burl began to explain what they were to do, but one or two of the men dared remonstrate, saying humbly that they were afraid to part from him. If they might embark upon the same thing with him they would be safe, but otherwise they were afraid. Burl cast an apprehensive glance at the sky. Day was coming rapidly on. Soon the red mushrooms would begin to shoot their columns of deadly dust into the air. This was no time to pause and deliberate. Then Saya spoke softly. Burl listened and made a mighty sacrifice. He took his gorgeous velvet cloak from his shoulders it was made from the wing of a great moth, and tore it into a dozen long, irregular pieces, tearing it along the lines of the sinews that reinforced it. He planted his spear upright in the largest piece of shelf fungus, and caused his followers to do likewise, then fastened the strips of sinew and velvet to his spear shaft, and ordered them to do the same with the other spears. In a matter of minutes the dozen tiny rafts were bobbing on the water, clustered about the larger central bit. Then, one by one, the tribe folk took their places and Burl shoved off. The agglomeration of cranky, unseaworthy bits of shelf fungus moved slowly out from the shore until the current caught it. Burl and Saya sat upon the central bit, with the other trustful but somewhat frightened pink-skinned people all about them and as they began to move between the mushroom-lined banks of the river and the mist of the night began to lift from its surface, far in the interior of the forest of the red fungoids a column of red leaped into the air. The first of the malignant growths had cast its cargo of poisonous dust into the still humid atmosphere. The cone-like column spread out and grew thin, but even after it had shrunk into the earth, a reddish taint remained in the air about the place where it had been. The deadly red haze that hung all through the day over the red forest was in process of formation. But by that time the unstable fungus crafts were far down the river, bobbing and twirling in the current with the wide-eyed people upon them gazing in wonderment at the shores as they glided by. The red mushrooms grew less numerous upon the banks. Other growths took their places. Moles and rusts covered the ground as grass had done in ages past. Mushrooms showed their creamy, rounded heads. Malformed things with swollen trunks and branches and strange mockery of the trees they had superseded made their appearance and once the tribesmen saw the dark bulk of a hunting spider outlined for a moment upon the bank. All the long day they rode upon the current, while the insect life that had been absent in the neighborhood of the forest of death made its appearance again. Bees once more droned overhead, and wasps and dragonflies. Four-inch mosquitoes made their appearance to be fought off by the tribe-folk with lusty blows, and glittering beetles and shining flies, whose bodies glittered with a metallic luster, buzzed and flew above the water. Huge butterflies once more were seen, dancing above the steaming, festering earth, 
in an apparent ecstasy from the mere fact of existence, and all the thousand and one forms of insect life that flew and crawled and swam and dived showed themselves to the tribesmen on the raft. Water beetles came lazily to the surface to snap with sudden energy at mosquitoes busily laying their eggs in the nearby stagnant water by the river banks. Burl pointed out to Saya with some excitement their silver breastplates that shone as they darted under the water again, and the shell-covered boats of a thousand caddis-worms floated in the eddies and backwaters of the stream. Water-boatmen and whirligigs, almost alone among insects and not having shared in the general increase of size, danced upon the oily waves. The day wore on as the shores flowed by. The tribesfolk ate of their burdens of mushroom and meat, and drank from the fresh water of the river. Then, when afternoon came, the character of the country about the stream changed. The banks fell away, and the current slackened. The shores became indefinite, and the river merged itself into a swamp a vast swamp from which a continual muttering came which the tribesmen heard for a long time before they saw the swamp itself. The water seemed to turn black, as black mud took the place of the clay that had formed its bed, and slowly, here and there, then more frequently, floating green things that were stationary and did not move with the current appeared. They were the leaves of water-lilies that had remained with the giant cabbages and a very few other plants in the midst of a fungoid world. The green leaves were twelve feet across, and any one of them would have floated the whole of Burl's tribe. Presently they grew numerous, so that the channel was made narrow, and the mushroom rafts passed between rows of the great leaves with here and there a colossal waxen blossom in which three men might have hidden and which exhaled an almost overpowering fragrance into the air. And the muttering that had been heard far away grew in volume to an intermittent, incredibly deep bass roar. It seemed to come from the banks on either side, and actually was the discordant croaking of the giant frogs grown to eight feet in length, which lived and loved in the huge swamp, above which golden butterflies danced in ecstasy, and which the transcendently beautiful blossoms of the water-lilies filled with fragrance. The swamp was a place of riotous life. The green bodies of the colossal frogs, perched upon the banks in strange immobility, and only opening their huge mouths, to emit their thunderous croakings. The green bodies of the frogs blended queerly with the vivid color of the water-lily leaves. Dragonflies fluttered in their swift and angular flight above the black and reeking mud. Green bottles and blue bottles and a hundred other species of flies buzzed busily in the misty air, now and then falling prey to the licking tongues of the frogs. Bees droned overhead in flight less preoccupied and worried than elsewhere, flitting from blossom to blossom of the tremendous water-lilies, loading their crops with honey and the bristles of their legs with yellow pollen. Everywhere over the mushroom-covered world the air was never quite free from mist and the steamy exhalations of the pools, but here in the swamps the atmosphere was so heavily laden with moisture that the bodies of the tribesfolk were covered with glistening droplets, while the wide, flat water-lily leaves glittered like platters of jewels from the steam that had condensed upon their upper surfaces. The air was full of shining bodies and iridescent wings. Myriads of tiny midges, no more than three or four inches across their wings, danced above the slow-flowing water and butterflies of every imaginable shade and color, from the most delicate lavender to the most vivid carmine, danced and fluttered, alighting upon the white water-lilies to sip daintily of their nectar, skimming the surface of the water, enamored of their brightly tinted reflections. 
and the pink-skinned tribesfolk floating through this fairyland on their mushroom rafts gazed with wide eyes at the beauty about them and drew in great breaths of the intoxicating fragrance of the great white flowers that floated like elfin boats upon the dark water end of chapter 4